This is Lecture 6, covering epithelial and connective tissues. We've talked about the chemical level of how atoms combine to form molecules, which interact to form cells at the cellular level, and cells secrete and regulate extracellular ma uh, material and fluids, and those fluids with the cells combine together to form tissues. And each of these tissues has a special function. We've talked about these tissues before epithelial, connective, muscle, and neural tissue. Muscle tissue contracts to produce movement and is in skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth. Neural tissue is gonna conduct electrical impulses and carry information. The focus of this lecture will be on epithelial tissue and connective tissue. Epithelial tissue, in a nutshell, is going to cover the exposed surfaces and secrete different compounds, whereas connective tissue connects spaces together, fills a lot of internal space, provides structural support, and stores energy. First, we are going to talk about epithelial tissue. Now, epithelial tissue, or epithelium, consists of sheets of cells that cover or line an exposed surface, either internal or external. And these categories include the general from epithelial tissue, we go into epithelia, and glands. Glands are found in the form of exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands release things into the outside environment. Endocrine glands release things inside of our body. Now, the functions of epithelial tissue are as follows. First, it provides physical protection. This is typically done to prevent surface abrasion, dehydration, or destruction by chemical or biological agents. It controls permeability. So a lot of epithelial cells are capable of selective absorption or secretion, so it's going to control what moves through the cell. Epithelial cells provide sensation. So specialized epithelial cells can detect changes in the environment. An example of this would be specific touch receptors that we have in our skin. And finally, epithelial cells produce specialized secretions. Glandular epithelial cells produce given secretions for either exocrine or endocrine function. Now, there are a few features or characteristics of epithelial cells that we'll see that kind of is this case with all epithelial cells. First is cellularity. Cellularity means that there is very little extracellular space. C uh, the cells are actually comprised almost entirely of cells bound to each other. There's no space between them. Next is polarity. That means that there is an apical and basal surface. We know there is a specific surface that faces the exterior of the body or the internal space, and another one that is bound to an actual space on the lateral or basal layers, the basal lateral surface. This leads you into the next portion, which is attachment. All epithelial cells are bound on the basal side to a strong underlying basement membrane, known as a basal lamina and this is going to be shared with connective tissue. Epithelial cells are all avascular. This means they have no blood vessels, and they obtain nutrients via transport across the surface of the actual cell membrane and are reproduced through stem cells. That leads us into our next point, which is regeneration. Regeneration means that epithelial cells are constantly regenerated to replace lost or damaged cells. So they have germana germanative cells or stem cells that produce these. The epithelial cells are organized in sheets or layers. All epithelial cells are arranged in sheets consisting of one or more layers. Now, there are some s epithelial cells that have specialized secretions. Many epithelial cells secrete different substances, and some are arranged into glandular tissue, and we know these as glands. And the last is that they are specialized for transport. Many epithelial cells have special structures for moving material across the surface of the membrane. They might have different cilia or microvilli, so those extensions off of the membrane. Here's a sample of some of the things that we talked about. Notice that there is a basolateral surface where they are actually attached and bound at the side and then bound to a basal lamina. They have an apical surface up top with different cilia on top or microvilli to increase surface area or allow things to move across the actual surface of the cell. Continuing our look at epithelial cells, we are now looking at the classification of epithelial cells, and there are really two major factors that we classify by, and that's in layering or shape. There are three shapes of 
epithelial cells, and they come in squamous, which is a kind of fried egg or a flattened squat shape. Uh, cuboidal, which is going to be a square or cube shape, shape with a large centrally located nucleus. And then columnar, which is longer than it is wide and oftentimes does contain different sorts of cellular projections like microvilli or cilia. The layering is going to come in either simple or, as you see here, simple meaning one layer or stratified. Stratified means multiple layers, as we can see here with squamous, cuboidal, and columnar in a stratified varieties where they have more than one layer. When looking at identifying the actual shape of the cell, we always look towards the apical surface to determine the shape of the cell in its variety. In the case of squamous, a lot of the basal layer cells look very cuboidal, but noting the apical surface, it again has that fried egg shape. Also, looking at columnar, we see again, towards the basal layer, it looks cuboidal at its basal layer. But at the apical surface, it is longer than it is wide, and therefore it is columnar. So these are the different stratified varieties. Giving examples of each one of these types, first would be simple squamous. Simple squamous is delicate and not protective. It is mostly involved in absorption or reduction of friction and is found in the alveoli of the lungs and the lining of blood vessels as well as different serous membranes. Here we can see example of it being in the different mesothelial structures. And this is in the alveoli of the lungs. Note the flattened overall structure as it is in between each of the walls of the alveoli. This is to allow for the adequate exchange of gases in the lungs. The next is going to be stratified squamous. Stratified squamous is seen in a lot of places in the body, in the skin surface, lining of the mouth, throat, esophagus, vagina, and anus. And it is used for protection against mechanical damage, primarily for abrasion, but also against pathogens and chemical attacks. And it does come in two varieties, our stratified squamous in keratinized or non-keratinized. Here we can see the squamous layer as it is bound to a basal lamina on the histology slide at the bottom. And notice towards the apical surface, it is flattened. So as I said earlier, stratified squamous comes in keratinized and non-keratinized varieties. Keratinized is where the superficial layer is packed with keratin. It is tough and water resistant. It resists both mechanical stress and dehydration and is found on the surface of the skin. This is actually what allows our skin to callus over and become tougher over time. Non-keratinized skin makes up the rest of the stratified squamous that's not typically found on the skin. And this resists abrasion, but it can dry out. It's found in the oral cavity, the pharynx, esophagus, anus, and vagina. Here we can see samples of the keratinized skin cells. Keratin fibers are actually going to thicken that outer surface of the skin cell and make it a lot tougher than a non-keratinized variety. Looking at cuboidal cells, they primarily deal with secretion and absorption, and that is of course the case with simple cuboidal cells. Simple cuboidal cells are found throughout the various glands like thyroid and salivary glands as well as the ducts of the pancreas and kidney tubules and they are specialized for absorption and secretion. Here we can see the simple cuboidal cells inside the nephron tubes of the kidney that allow for absorption and secretion throughout the kidney tubule. Next is stratified cuboidal. This is the rarest of all the epithelial tissue, and it is found in sweat glands as well as mammary glands. It is specialized for secretion and typically surrounds the lumen of a duct in order to actually release into it. This is going to produce a lot of compounds that we see in exocrine function. Moving to columnar, again, they are longer than they are wide, and they look like cuboidal in transverse sections. They are marked by the polarity of their nucleus and organelles, and they are for protection, absorption, and secretion. Our first type will be simple columnar. Simple columnar is going to be found throughout the stomach, intestines, uterine tubes, and many excretory ducts. It provides very limited protection, but it is excellent in 
for absorption and secretion, and as such, usually contains microvilli or the brush border. Here, we can see different simple columnar epithelial cells from the digestive tract that also contain goblet cells. Goblet cells are going to be cell structures in, within epithelial cells that will secrete a mucus-like layer across the cell surface membrane, usually to protect it from acidic damage. Next will be stratified columnar. This is also very rare, and it provides protection in some secretory functions in portions of the pharynx, urethra, anus, and some ducts. There are a few other types that are a little bit different than some of the other major types of epithelial tissue. The first being a pseudostratified columnar. Pseudostratified columnar is similar to the stratified columnar. However, it has a very disorganized appearance to it, and the nuclei tend to be in a lot of disorder as opposed to the more uniformity of a stratified columnar structure. Now, the pseudostratified is found throughout the respiratory tract uh, in the nasal cavity, trachea, and bronchi, and it's ciliated always. All the cells are resting on the basal lamina, but the nuclei are at various distances from the surface, and what the cilia on top of the pseudostratified will do is provide protection and secretion. In the case of the respiratory tract, it's going to allow you to actually move different dust or uh, pathogen compounds up against the gradient of the respiratory tract and get things out of the lungs to protect you. The next will be transitional epithelium, and it's a very unique epithelial tissue that is stratified, but it is specialized to permit stretch. The top layer changes appearance based on whether it's relaxed or stretched, and it is found in the urinary bladder, ureters, and renal pelvis. The final type of epithelial tissue is glandular epithelium. Now this can look like any of the others, but they're specialized collections of epithelial cells that are designed to produce secretions. And they can be scattered cells or in complex organs. And they come in two major types, endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine glands release secretions into the blood, lymph, or interstitial fluid and are often known as hormones. Exocrine glands release secretions into ducts that empty onto the epithelial surface. They come in the merocrine gland, which an example would be the salivary gland or sweat gland, and apocrine glands, which would be mammary glands and axillary glands. We'll talk more about those later. As stated before, epithelial cells have the concept of cellularity. So the cells are bound together and very tightly joined. And the cells within this tissue connect to each other via what is known as cellular junctions or attachments. There are three major categories that we will talk about. They are tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes or anchoring junctions. Of the three types of cellular junctions, the first type is tight junction. Tight junctions are, have protein fibers that extend between the cells and internal cytoskeleton to restrict movement of materials through the space between adjacent cells. So an example of this would be capillary walls. They have an interlocking membrane protein that creates a tight, almost waterproof layer. The next type of cellular junction is a gap junction. Here, cells are connected by passageways to allow ions and water to pass through. They are often used to create different sorts of electrically linked cell structures. These are found in the heart wall. Finally, we have anchoring junctions or desmosomes. These are protein and glycoprotein fibers that form a mechanically strong connection between adjacent cells. So desmosomes are used to tie skin cells in the epidermis together and will link to each other in a form of cellular adhesion. Moving on from epithelial, we'll now start talking about connective tissue. Connective tissue is a tissue that supports structurally or physiologically and separates or connects other types of tissue. It's found throughout the body but not exposed to the external environment. And unlike epithelial tissue, connective tissue is comprised largely of something called an extracellular matrix. Now there are three basic components shared by connective tissues. All connective tissues have these three things. The first is a specialized cell, a cell that is designed to monitor and keep the tissue alive. 
The second is extracellular protein fibers. These fibers are going to help create a lot of the overall body of the connective tissue and determine its overall strength and elasticity. The third is a fluid that is called a ground substance. Now this ground substance is generally a gel-like compound but can sometimes be a little bit more solid or it can be more liquid depending upon the type of connective tissue you're dealing with. The combination of two and three, the protein fibers and the ground substance, make up what is called the matrix. Matrix consists of these two compounds and is surrounded by the cells. It accounts for a majority of the connective tissue volume and there are fewer cells and more extracellular material when compared to epithelial tissue. So it's more about the extracellular material in connective tissue. The functions of connective tissue are as follows. It establishes a structural framework for the body. It transports fluids and dissolved materials throughout it. It protects delicate organs. It supports, surrounds, and interconnects other types of tissue. And it stores energy, especially in the form of triglycerides or fats. And it finally, it defends the body from invading microorganisms. Looking at the different classifications of connective tissue, we have connective tissue proper, fluid connective tissues, and supporting connective tissues. When discussing fluid connective tissues, there's really two types, blood and lymph, and this has a matrix of liquid. We'll talk about these more in the anatomy physiology class later. Supporting connective tissues have a matrix that consists of a gel or more solid uh, calcium-based substance, and this is in the form of cartilage and bone. We will talk about these again later in the class. The focus on the rest of this lecture will be on connective tissue proper. This comes in loose and dense uh, types of connective tissue, and this type of connective tissue proper has a matrix of fibers. When looking at connective tissue proper, we have the different types of fibers that determine its overall strength and what type of connective tissue it is. The first type is a reticular fiber. These are strong and form a branching network, providing more structural support for different things like organs in the body. Collagen fibers are thick and very strong. We find a lot of these in the skin that maintain its overall structure. And then elastic fibers. These are slender and very stretchy. They allow things to morph and change shape, but then bounce back and return to their original shape. The ground substance of connective tissue proper is going to be clear and colorless. It's viscous and syrupy due to the presence of proteoglycans as well as glycoproteins. Connective tissue proper has many components. I won't have you memorize these for any sort of exam, but they're good and useful information to know moving forward. They come in either fixed or wandering components. The fixed components would have things like melanocytes. These synthesize melanin or skin pigment macrophages that would be fixed in this case, and these are going to be specialized cells that engulf debris and pathogens, mast cells that stimulate inflammation and mobilize defense, fibroblasts that are going to synthesize extracellular fibers to help rebuild a lot of the connective tissue, and adipocytes. These are going to be a specialized type of connective tissue that would store lipid reserves. Of the wandering types of connective tissue proper cells, and structures found in it, we have plasma cells, which will be immune cell producing antibodies, free macrophages, which are going to be similar to the fixed macrophages, but these can move around and they engulf debris and pathogens, mesenchymal cells, these are stem cells that aid in tissue repair, and then finally leukocytes, kind of a form of macrophage, but these are going to be more immune system cells and deal with specific disease. In this diagram, we can see all of the structures that we talked about on the previous and you can see how they're kind of arranged in a very chaotic fashion. The collagen fibers are going to be the large, almost spaghetti noodle looking fibers that uh, engulf a lot of these compounds. Going through each type of connective tissue, first and foremost, we'll talk about our loose connective tissues. And this is going to consist of packing material that kind of fills the space between organs, cushions, and supports. Our first type is areolar tissue. Areolar tissue is the least specialized and is very abundant. It contains all cell and fiber types. It's stretchable, elastic, but at the same time, very weak. Its design is cushioning. It's a form of almost packing popcorn throughout the body. It's found almost 
almost everywhere within the body. It's found deep in the dermis, covering epithelial linings of the digestive, respiratory, urinary tracts. It's between muscles, around blood vessels, nerves, joints. It's almost everywhere. Adipose tissue is our next form. Adipose tissue is otherwise known as fat cells, and this is a lipid storage, and it uses insulation, packing, and filling. It's mostly consisting of adipocytes with some fibroblasts in it, and it is, we have white and brown adipose tissue that have different functions, but we won't go too far into that. It's typically found uh, deep into our dermis, so attached to the skin. It's also found next to a lot of our organs, as well as padding around the eyes, uh, kidneys, in our breast tissue as well for the ladies. Um, but that's going to be the adipocytes, your fat cells. Next would be reticular tissue. Reticular tissue appears loose, but it's not elastic, and it is a mixture mostly of reticular fibers, fibroblasts, and macrophages. It's found primarily in the liver and bone marrow, and it's de designed to provide supporting framework to give a little bit more structure to something that otherwise wouldn't have it. Next, we have dense connective tissue. Now, most of the volume is comprised of fibers with very little ground substance, so it's denser, and few cells. It's often called co uh, collagenous tissue because it's dominated by collagen fibers. Here, we can see dense, regular connective tissue. This provides a firm attachment and conducts a uh, pull between muscles, reduces friction. It's going to be very uniform in its organization. Here, we can see the collagen fibers acts as a binding between the different actual muscle cells. And it's found between skeletal muscles of the skeleton, um, between bones or stabilizing positions of internal organs, as well as covering a lot of skeletal muscle and deep fascia. The next type of dense connective tissue is elastic tissue. Elastic tissue has a large amount of elastic fibers as well as collagen, and it is spongy and resilient. It is found supporting transitional epithelia, blood vessels, and respiratory passageways, all things that have to stretch. And its function, again, is to stabilize the position of different the vertebrae as well as the penis and cushions shock and permits expansion and contraction of organs. The final type of dense connective tissue is dense irregular connective tissue. Now, this is an interwoven type of connective tissue. It's interwoven network that resists stresses from any direction is found in the dermis. It surrounds cartilage. It's found in bone, joint cavities, and most organs. So its entire function is to provide strength to resist force applied. It helps to prevent the overexpansion of organs such as the urinary bladder. And you can see here in the histological slides that it is a dense structure that is going to be very irregular in its organization, the college fibers that are abound in different bundles.